Okay, we're in Carnegie Library, and this library has great significance to me because um, this is uh, the refuge of my mother when she was pregnant with me in um, the summer of 1962. And she, was, um, she had lots on her mind back then, lots on her mind. She had left her husband in Jamaica. He was a bit of a violent man, so she came here to start a new life. She lived on Hearn Hill Road, the location of the library, just about five minutes down the road from here. And uh, my father lived on Northland Street, which is about two roads up, going towards Camberwell. And obviously they met, they had an affair, and my mother became pregnant with me. But um, her husband um, followed my mother to here from Jamaica, and um, he found her pregnant. And so obviously <laughs> that wasn't the... Uh, the best revelation in the world, you know, for him to uh, try and deal with. So um, basically he said to her that um, you've got to give up that baby once it's born. So you can imagine the stress that my mother had. And this is a place where she used to come to as a refuge, as I said, and she was a great reader. When she was young, she wanted to be a journalist for the Daily Gleaner, the national newspaper of Jamaica, and she wanted to be a photographer. And so she spent her pregnant months here looking at photography books, fiction books, and so on. And so when I um, return to Brixton, I mean, I don't live too far now, but when I do, I often come up to this library. It's my favorite library. It's a, it's a beautiful building. I just try and um, sit down and reflect on what, um, you know, the stresses that both of my parents went through to, um, you know, um, give birth to me, basically, because um, when she did give birth to me, she had to give me up to my father. And my father, um, uh, he put me in the care of his sister who lived on Milkwood Road, which is just another road further along. And so this road, uh, the surrounding areas to um, this library mean a great deal to me because this is where I spent my very early years when I was one, two, three, until I, um, until I was moved on to um, Shirley Oaks Children's Home. And so, yes, it has great significance. And I always, it, I always get a bit overwhelmed when I see the library um, because my mum's still alive. When I see her in Washington, D.C., she sometimes discusses those difficult months that she had when she was pregnant with me and so on. And so whenever I pass it, whenever I go inside, I always kind of sit down, close my eyes and just reflect, you know, because it's part of my, part of my story, part of my narrative very important for me and I really believe that um, the reading gene that I have came from her because she was an avid reader and so whatever troubles I had growing up um, as a kid, as a teenager, all the stormy um, episodes I had, the, the temper and so on, um, reading was a refuge for me now and again. Like when I was locked up in a room somewhere in an outhouse in the in some shed in Shirley Oaks, um, sometimes a house mother or house father would throw me a book underneath the gap of the door. And then I would relax and read and try to calm down. And that's always been a staple of my life up to this day. When things get too much for me, um, I do pick up a book and read or a piece of poetry or whatever. And it makes me feel that little better. And uh, I strongly believe that comes from my mum. You know, and it gives me some kind of comfort so um, I'm in a very comfortable position, surrounded by books on all sides. And um, for me, this is the most beautiful library that Lambeth, have, that Lambeth has. And uh, again, um, it's overwhelming when I look around the building. And I know they've got a little garden at the back. And so sometimes in the summer, I'll go out there and sit down on one of the tables and, and reflect you know, on my life and um, how far or how short I've come. But it, it, it always comes back to here. Um, Hearn Hill Road, Northland Street, Milkwood Road, it always comes back to these areas. Um, when I think of Brixton, that's, that's what I think of the most. These, um, the streets leading off Coll Arbor Lane, where my parents started to make a life, where they struggled. You know, in Jamaica was um, difficult for them, but they came here and uh, they wanted to give their children a better life. Obviously, difficulties come with that. But um, I describe myself as a survivor because I survived the, the turmoil, the trauma of um, the children's home. And I, I, I'm able to write about those experiences. So that's why when I decided to write fiction, I wanted to include those streets and roads and the states that um, 
that was part of my narrative into my fiction because um, everyone's story is very important. It doesn't matter who you are. And fiction should not just be about an elite. It should be about everybody. I strongly believe that. And so the people who grew up here, my parents' generation, my generation, I mean, I returned to Brixton at 14. I lived in a, um, a social services hostel in Elm Park, just off Brixton Hill. And um, I, I immersed myself in reggae, sound system, culture. I became a, um, a DJ, not a very good one, not as good as the likes of Smiley Culture or Ashley Senator or people like that, but um, I tried my best. But um, I had this writing habit. And I don't know, maybe it comes from the fact that um, my mother read so much. Maybe that was in me, you know, words were in me from, from when I was a month, two months, who knows how old I was, you know, when it kind of, maybe it's part of my DNA words. And so little did I know then, because at that point, I did not know my mother. I didn't know where she was living or my father. And so sometimes I think parents give you something that you're not even aware of until later on in life when you... Um, when you come back, and as I said before, you reflect in your life, I sit down in this library and I'm thinking, yeah, I can make, I can make that connection. And so it, it definitely helped me. And I believe if you want to um, go back to the root of my career, the right and talent that I seem to have um, been given, you have to go back to this library, you know, where my mum um, read and read and read, you know, as some kind of refuge, as I said before, from the turmoil that was swirling around her. Brixton has always inspired my writing, not just as a location, but the characters who grew up in those locations. I mean, when I returned at 14, 15, um, I felt kind of removed from the characters in Brixton because um, I was institutionalised, if you like. I spent so long, what, 11, 12 years in a children's home that when I returned, I didn't feel like I belonged. And so for much of that time in 77, 78, 79, I just had to observe and try to become me again, try to um, dive back into my culture, if you like, you know, because I felt so out of it, so unlike anybody around me. I could not even um, walk like my fellow Brixtonian. I could not even talk like my fellow Brixtonian. I had to relearn that all over again. And so that lended me to um, observing everybody how they interact, how they uh, engage, especially in family situations. When I used to go to my um, friends' houses and watch how the families interact, I would, I would be a keen-eyed observer to see how that worked out. And then I realised that um, in, um, in those families that it wasn't all uh, sugar and honey and sweetness and all sorts. People did fill out, people did have fights, people did um, you know, get crazy with each other and so on. And so all this informed my fiction. So it was the location, but also the vivid characters that were in Brixton at the time. Like when I um, first went to the front line, um, Routon Road, and I bought two pound draw of weed, sometimes I just used to hang around and see how, those, how these guys interacted with the women and so on, the excitement, the music. It all really inf informed me and infused me with lots of energy to, um, you know, that I stored in my head. And, so I could use so a fiction later. I didn't know at the time that I would go into fiction, but it, I just found it fascinating and amazing to see this um, play out in front of me, if you like. And, um, and so the streets, you know, came um, printed in my head, you know, Routon Road, Mile Road, Cowley Estate, um, Tulsa Estate, and um, all those local areas that I frequented, um, Shepherd's, Shepherd's Youth Club, for instance, and Routon, all these places, this remain, um, remain like, you know, a presence in my head. So when I finally sat down to write um, in my early 30s, um, I didn't really have to do that much research because it was all there, because I'm just absorbing everything that was around me, the energy, especially the energy of the characters. They just leaped into my brain, and I could not help but write about them. I just could not help to. And so it, it came back to me, I mean... When I wrote East of Acre Lane, my second novel, which has the backdrop of the um, 1981 Brixton riots, at first that book was something like um, 150,000 words. I mean, my editor had to cut it down to around about 80, 90 because I had so much I wanted to say. And even um, my debut novel, Brixton Rock, I could have gone on forever because um, obviously the experience of a, a 
that informed me, the experience of living in a children's home. That, and the, um, my um, move into uh, the Brixton area, I could have, you know, so many characters I met in those days that um, just stood up and were bigger than, bigger than life, if you like. You know, the, um, the sound system guys, they were like film stars to me. And um, uh, the MC guys as well. I mean, I remember the sound systems, um, people like um, Chubba Ute, uh, people like, um, I can't remember the, uh, Mukha from Safana B, people like that when I used to go Bally High. They were like, you know, they were like the Charles Bronson, the Steve McQueen's, someone like me, who would try to imitate them and, you know, try to dress like them. And again, it remained printed in my memory, it really did. And so when I'd sit down and do a description of how a sound guy used to, like, used to look, it was no problem for me because it was just there. Maybe I have a good memory, I don't know, but um, it was just all there in front of me. And um, for a kid who, want, who just wanted to um, express himself, sometimes express the rage that I felt growing up, I wanted to describe everything. It was, Brixton was a perfect place for me, it really was. In some ways, it was like a refuge. It was like a coming home, like a coming home, because in a children's home, I never felt accepted, you know, um, not just because I was poor, but because I was black also. So really, I was probably even under the underclass, if you like. And that's how I felt I was viewed by society. But coming to Brixton and seeing um, that, hey, I'm not the lowest of the low, that I can be accepted here, you know, it kind of, um, lifted me up a little bit, because my, my self-esteem was very low. But um, sometimes, he, when I was 14, 15, I used to hear the Russes talk about going back to Africa and that where are people who come from kings and queens of Africa. And that kind of made me walk that little bit taller, you know? Made me feel that little bit prouder. Where before, um, I was kind of brainwashed into thinking Tarzan would always beat up any black guys that he come across or whatever, and we was the lowest of the low. We are uneducated, you know, that's what, I was, that's what I grew up with. And so Brixton, again, coming here was an education for me. You know, it made me culturally aware of my past, my family's past and so on. And uh, I guess that journey was complete when um, I actually traced my parents, where they could um, inform me of uh, my family history and so on. So I could fit all the jigsaw together. But um, certainly Brixton was the place where I got the pieces for that jigsaw, if you like. You know, where before they all scrambled all over the place. But I could start putting the pieces together. Ah, you know, um, I, I learned about Marcus Garvey. Ah, I started to hear lyrics from Burning Spear about um, how a uh, European man raped Africa and so on. You know, I could start putting the pieces together. And so that's what it did for me this area, coming back here. It, it gave me a huge energy boost. It gave me great belief that, hey, you know, I don't have to build, I don't, I don't have to feel downtrodden. I could feel proud of who I am and not feel ashamed that, hey, I might have been in a home, I might be black, I might be poor, but, um, you know, I could still stand up and walk tall. Well, one of my first experiences of um, coming to Brixham, I remember walking up um, Routon Road, and it was quite a a lot of squats there, a lot of squats. And it wasn't just black guys or black women or whatever. Sometimes you, you had hippies or whatever, you know. And, um, some, you know, more often than not, I was hungry, had no money, wasn't going to school, whatever. And um, every now and again, I mean, I never went hungry. Uh, I know that sounds like a contradiction, but um, in the days where I never had no breakfast or lunch or, for instance, I could walk up Routon Road and someone would, might recognise me and say, hey, uh, you, you don't look so good today. You know, it could be a hippie, could be a rasta, could be anybody. They said, hey, here's, um, we're going to club some money together for you to get some fish and chips or whatever. You know, and so I thought, ah, oh, that's never happened to me before. You know, I could walk in um, Croydon or somewhere else, and people just look at me like I'm some kind of threat. You know, I had this wild hair, or I, had a, I had a mean scowl and so on. But here, you know, I didn't have to uh, produce that mean scowl or or, uh, you know, give my devil eyes or whatever, or hate the world, because um, there are many people like me. Maybe uh, not with my um, children's home experience, but all trying to uh, discover some kind of acceptance, or all trying to, uh, you know, meek out, eke out some kind of living, trying to make good out of bad, or, you know, 
people came from desperate situations and so on. And so I felt as if I was um, not the only one, if you like, who's going through this transition. And he, he wanted acceptance, because that's what human beings are. You, you know, we just want acceptance wherever we go. So whether I went to Liverpool, whether I went to Manchester, that's what we need. We need that kind of social acceptance to, um, you know, to lift up ourselves, if you like. And I felt that uh, Brixton gave me that, where other areas did not necessarily do that. Like um, when I was in Brixton in those early years, and when I was you know, mid-teenager, and I went to other areas. Uh, again, um, people looked on us with scorn and, you know, what's he doing here and, and so on. You know, you can see it on their faces. Um, even when I went up to North London in black areas, sometimes, you know, they um, hear your accent, know that you're a South London boy or whatever, and they wouldn't trust you, they wouldn't accept you and so on. There's, there's, there used to be this um, friction, if you like. But um, for me, Brixton was the place where I kind of felt comfortable, you know, and uh, we didn't have any post-cold rivalries back then. There were South System rivalries, but I felt at ease going to a party in Cowley Estate, Tulsa Estate, Dorset Road Estate, you know, um, a lot of us used to just walk to a party, we didn't have cars, none of us had cars in those days, and we felt comfortable raving 10 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning, and we felt comfortable walking home, you know, three, four miles from South Lambeth to Brixton Hill, and no one would think, no one would think anything of it. You know, never felt any danger, never really. Um, yes, there were beasts here and there, but um, basically, you didn't um, in involve yourself in badness. Then badness never came to your door, and so it was an enlightenment for me. You know, um, it was like, it, as I said, it was an education. Um, just observing how everybody interacted, everybody got on. Uh, it wasn't all, obviously, you're going to get arguments and tear-ups now and again, and, but for most, for most of the while, it was a learning experience for me and uh, something that um, I was very fortunate to have because it, it backdropped where I am now. You know, it gave me the foundation to spring from that to, to where I am now. You know, if I never had that experience, I, I very much doubt if I'd be a writer. I don't think I would have got the confidence to be that writer. Being here gave me that confidence, and that was so necessary. Because if I went to um, somewhere else, I believe that um, my low esteem would have remained the same. I would never even dare to even think about being a writer. But w when you're living around musicians, um, MC, sound system guys, you start to realise that a lot of things are possible. And even some of those hippie guys, they were artists and so on. So um, if you love the arts, Brixton was a fantastic place. It really was. I mean, there were poets coming out of every door, it seemed. Singers, um, toasters, you know, so many creative people. And so sometimes you have to surround yourself, surround yourself with people like that to become creative yourself or get the confidence to be creative yourself. And that's what it did for me. It just gave me this creative energy boost that, hey, I can do this. You know, my first attempts were okay, they weren't so good, but I kept at it. And I was encouraged to keep at it, you know, until I get to the stage now. And, and sometimes I like to come down and see what the young people are doing because they can still inspire. You know, it's, Brixton seems to be a, an arts energy spot. It really does. I've spoken to Linton Crazy Johnson about it, and he agrees that um, there's something about Brixton that gives people energy to be creative. And when you see the amount of talent that's around here, it, it, um, it testifies that, I think, you know? What really excited me about going to dances or youth club dances and so on was to hear the guys with a microphone on a sound system, and sometimes they would uh, make lyrics about the next door neighbor complaining about the music. You know, something as simple as that. Or um, you might have a, a girl on the microphone complaining that her mother doesn't let her out to go to blues. And then, uh, during the night, you hear all kinds of different stories, all kinds of different expressions of um, people wanting to express their lives, you know, over the microphone and, and such. And it dawned on me that um, these uh, artists doing that, they're the real kind of reporters of the day because they're expressing um, something within themselves that um, I'm not seeing in the South London press. 
I'm not seeing reflected back on TV at the time or in drama or, or any kind of art form, you know, uh, uh, organised uh, art form, if you like, in, or in any kind of institution. I'm not seeing that reflected back at me, you know, the lives that we're, le we're leading. I'm not seeing that. And the only place where I saw that was in a dance. And I'm talking, what, uh, mid-70s, late-70s, early-80s. And these people are very, very creative. And they can make lyrics about anything, yeah. you know, even about a rubber ball that someone's bought or someone um, got gifted to it by a, a mother, uh, you know, how they luck playing with this rubber ball and they make a lyric about that. I'm thinking, wow, you know, so um, that only lended me to um, obviously try it, you know, because I had a lot of rage in me growing up in a children's home. So my first lyrics were about um, no dad, no mum, no family, this and that. And people thought, oh, God, he's, he, he's, he's kind of dark, isn't he? <laughs> you know, but they, I learned to kind of um, rhyme about uh, the good times I had, for instance, like in a pyjama party or whatever, you know, that um, Ricks and I had quite a few of. There's a sound system called Studio One. In fact, my cousins used to run Studio One, and uh, they had quite a few pyjama parties back in the day. And so my lyrics not only reflected... Um, the turmoil of my growing up experiences in a children's home, but also my coming to Brixton and actually embracing it and enjoying it. And so, um, and a good thing about Brixton is the quality was so high that if you try a lyric, um, people would soon let you know if it was any good or any bad. And if it was bad, obviously you had to go home and work at it. And that instilled in me a discipline, even now, where um, when I finish a story, you know, I go over it, I edit it, I go over it, I edit it. And it goes back to that experience of um, picking up a mic in a dance in Brixton when I'm 17 or 18 and trying something new and it's not working. And sometimes the crowd would say, that's rubbish, and it's and like boo you off the microphone, you know, because they're very vocal in their disapproval. So, you know, you've got you to gotta fix up, you've got to be disciplined enough to go back to the, the A4 notepad or the or the ledger book you got and you take out your pencil and cross out a line and improve it. And so that gave me editing skills, believe it or not. So, um, as I said, it was an education. And it, it told me that, um, or because you might have a ton of something, you still have to work at it. That, 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 that's what um, discipline it gave me, those early days of um, trying to be the MC. And there were so many great ones around in those days. I mean, the sound systems, uh, well, Michael will tell you, it's King Tubby's, Front Lines, there's so many. And there's so many good microphone guys. I mean, people like Tipper Irie, who um, I believe came from the same kind of areas, uh, not too far from here. He's still going strong. He tours the world, you know. And um, people like Maxi Priest, you know, he grew up singing on sound systems. And you, you, had, the, you had the great Saxon crew, including people like Levi. I looked up to those guys. They were incredible. I mean, I think for a while, those D-Days conquered anything that Jamaica offered at that point. They, they really did. And so it became very competitive, very competitive. So you had to go home and really work on those lyrics, you know. And uh, I remember um, sometimes in the hostel where I was staying, um, obviously we used to study the words or lyrics of the great, Reggae singers like Bob Marley, Burning Spear, Dennis Brown. But uh, some of the D-Days, they'll come on the new albums like the Beatles' White Album, for instance, or the Grateful Dead or Led Zeppelin or, or groups like, just to get an edge, just to get a line from somewhere that they could throw into the mix and come to the dance on a Friday, Saturday night and say, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick you with this now, you know? And so it was all about absorbing energy, different ideas, and uh, Brixton was certainly the place for that. I think the only place I can really compare was um, Hackney. We used to go to Hackney to a club sometimes on a Friday or Saturday night. I mean, the, um, the competitive DJ culture, that was the only place that could really compare with Brixton. Otherwise, Brixton was the place for lyrical expression. It really was. And it's a shame. It's a shame that popular culture never um, dipped into this bag because there's so much talent there. It's unbelievable. I mean, we had a touch of it in um, the film Babylon. Uh, I think uh, Jashaka Sound is featured, but that was just a small, small touch of it. I mean, many of our best DJs were not even featured in that. But um, I'm sure if it got greater exposure, some of the people I'm talking about, the MCs I'm talking about, um, would have been huge stars, not just Maxi Priest, but, um, you know, 
so many others could have been huge, huge stars. And I'm not talking just about UK, I'm talking globally, because the talent was definitely there. I think people like Levi from Saxon, he was signed to um, Island Records at one point, but um, it's a pity that so many others didn't push on, or perhaps weren't allowed to push on. I don't know. Um, you know, I can't give you the history of um, why the music uh, was not evolved or why these um, artists didn't make it big time, as they should have, as, in my eyes, as they should have done. That's, that's a difficult one. I guess uh, some, some people might say it was very localised. Some people might say that um, the mass audience would always prefer a Jamaican artist or whatever. I'm not sure, but I know for sure that the talent was definitely here. It's definitely here. It was, it, it was an environment because um, I, I guess it's like great writers together. I mean, if you remember um, the likes of Tolkien, uh, C.S. Lewis, and I can't remember the other, the other writer's name, they all went to um, university together. I think it was um, Oxford. And so that created a, um, a competitive atmosphere. And that's exactly the same thing that happened in Brixton. There was a competitive atmosphere here, so you had to up your game. And even little me, you know, I was no, I was no way big time, but um, I tried to up my game to the best I could. And that held me in good stead. It really held me in good stead to when I approached my writing career. And so when I got um, all these rejections, when I first tried to um, um, submit my, my first novel, I thought, well, what would I have done back in my DJ days? I would have just gone back to the table with a pencil bit of paper and trying to improve the lyric. And that's what I did with my novel. I just tried to improve it every time until it was accepted. And so I had that um, work ethic, if you like, created by being in this environment. And so that really helped me in a big way. When we wanted to go to a, a really good dance, uh, I remember the phone used to go off the hook on a Saturday evening, you know, from about eight o'clock onwards. Where are you going? Where are you going? You're going I Spy, you're going Saloid, you're going Dread Diamonds and so on. The phone would go off the hook. And so, um, as I said, we, we walked to, um, so the first place we'd walk would, could be uh, New Park Road Estate or um, Tulsa Estate. They were close by. And what we used to do, we used to uh, walk in about a group of about 20 or 25. We used to send one guy in one guy in and he used to check out the dance. This is say about after midnight when the dance would warm up. And, um, and usually it was about a pound entry. And he'd come back outside and he'd report. And the, our first question would be, how many girls are in the dance? And he would say, nah, man, nah, man, there's only about two girls there. And so, okay, we move on to the next one. You, you listen out for the bass line in Tulsa the State or wherever. And we try another dance. We, we get one guy with a pound coin or a pound note going to the dance, report back, is there any girl there? Yes, man, oh, they a girl, oh my God, the girl, the, the dance will ram up with girls, so everyone would pay the pound and go in and stay there for the night. Or sometimes, if um, we felt like it, say three o'clock in the morning, or four o'clock in the morning, we, there's always um, a dance on um, Villa Road, where Safana be, and I guess back in 79, when I, I started to seriously rave, in 79, 80, they had the biggest girl following. And um, they had a, a residence in Villa Road, not too far from here. And sometimes, I think it was two houses. They cleared out all the furniture, all the equipment, and they would bring in their boxes and amplifiers and stuff. And sometimes they wouldn't start the dance to four or five in the morning. And so if you had the energy, you'd go to Farnaby after your first party or blues dance or, or whatever. And, um, you know, there was boxes in every single room, ram pack, pound at the door, and you would, and they used to um, black out the windows or put block board up in the windows or chip board and paint it black. And you could uh, be dancing away with a girl of your choice, or if you was lucky enough, you know, we used to call it crubbing away until sometimes 12 noon Sunday, one o'clock Sunday afternoon. Can you, can you imagine that? and then go home and sleep until we go to work on a Monday. That's how, that's how great it was. I mean, some people talk about the, uh, the negative side of bricks and the police and this and that, and yes, that was there. But, you know, a lot of people fail to talk about the incredible party atmosphere, blues dances. They were, it, you know, it was, sometimes I tell my children about it, they don't believe me. When I say to them, 
you know, I raved on a Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. I said, what? And um, it seems like um, the generation following me, they don't have that rave gene inside them. But, oh, my God, we, we enjoyed ourselves. We really did. Sound system culture was incredible. It really was. Because on a Friday night, you could start your uh, evening by going to a town hall dance where all the big, big sounds, they would compete in um, venues like Brixton Town Hall. That used to finish by about 10 or whatever. Then after that, you might go to the Ace Cinema, watch some Jackie Chan Hong Kong movies, Kung Fu movies. Then after that, you'd find a, um, um, a blues dance, maybe in um, Five Ways, uh, Loughborough Estate or Stockwell Park Estate. Dread Diamonds were king around those kind of estates. And they used to sometimes play on a Friday night, so you'd rave there till five, six in the morning, and Safana B might be stringing up on a front line, Routon Road, five, six in the morning, so you won't get home till Saturday lunchtime. And then you repeat the process on a Saturday evening. And then, you know, um, obviously, um, you, you go down to Brixton on a Saturday afternoon, once you, wake, once you woke up, if you're able to, and then you, um, you might go to the Baron um, menswear shop, get yourself a, um, a silk-looking flower shirt. I think that was style back then, or farrow trousers. Or if you, you had the money, you could buy your um, crocodile shoes or lizard shoes and um, fix up your hair. There used to, there used to be a place in A Lane I used to go, um, Curlew's hairdressers. That was, you know, I saw ugly guys come out pretty you know, blown up headstyles and so on. There's another place in um, opposite to Farnaby's record shop in the market uh, on Cold Arbor Lane. That, um, but there's always, you know, if you went there, you'd be there all day. So I didn't go to that hair, uh, I didn't go to that hairdresser. I went to Acre Lane. And so that's what you did on a Saturday. And then uh, you'd get home, say, eight, nine, and then the phone would start, you know. And, um, and in those days, we'd say, you hold a fresh, in other words. You, you slap on the deodorant and whatever. You style your hair or you put your steps in on. You put your nine carat gold on and off you go. Off you go to your night's entertainment. And I cannot think of any place in London that had the entertainment that we had. You know, if you're 16, 17, 18, it, it was an incredible place to be. And um, Calabar Lane was one of those places where... Um, there's always something going on in one of the streets, maybe down Flaxman, the state down there. There's always a blues going on down there on a Saturday night. You head there and, you know, it was, you enjoyed yourself. And people seem to forget that, you know, the amount of fun and pure entertainment that you had. And also the music. I mean, the music that was um, being made in Jamaica back then was phenomenal. And also the lovers rock as well. You know, it was just phenomenal. The music scene was really phenomenal. So I lapped it up. I mean, from a kid who uh, virtually was, um, was raised in the countryside, for me, it was, it was like, you know, heaven. Sounds awesome. It, it was. <laughs> I feel like we're missing out now. <laughs> but the key seems to have been the girls. Oh, yes. I mean, sound system guys, they were smart. You know, um, if you could get... Sometimes they would let the girls in free. <laughs> so the guys would... They'd have to pay, you know, <laughs> they'd have to pay the pound to get in. But that was the key, you know. You get the girls in, the guys would follow, no doubt. And so um, that's how we met, that's how we, you know, that's how we interacted and so on. Sometimes, I mean, those, this, these are the days before um, mobile phones. So if you met a girl, um, it wasn't guaranteed that you might see her next week. Or it wasn't guaranteed that the number she gave you was the right one. There was quite a number of occasions where um, a girl would, might write down a number on a slip of paper, and I phoned up, and I would get, um, good afternoon, this is Batsy Dog's home, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, that would happen if, say, the girl had a boyfriend already, or whatever, you know, so, um, all fun and love. <laughs> okay, sound systems, um, basically, they were mobile discos, but um, bigger, if you like, if you can imagine enormous mobile discos, I mean, it was... Uh, they had to have 18-inch bass speakers, you know, to pump out the bass or the regular music. And these were 18-inch, usually Goodmans, made by Goodmans. I mean, Goodmans, they, 
they've done incredible business from the sound systems of, uh, of reggae. They really did. And these sound systems, they would stack up. Sometimes they were as big as wardrobes, these sound system um, speaker box cabinets. They were huge. I was a box boy. You know, sometimes uh, you had no money. You had to um, sometimes beg a sound system owner if you could uh, lift, lift his boxes for him because they were very heavy. And there was one time I was lifting a box for a sound system called King Tubby in a once of town hall. And there was about three or four flights of um, stairs you had to get up to before you um, came to the hall. And we had this, what we called a four face, four 18 inch bass speakers in this one cabinet. And oh my God, it was heavy. There was about four or five of us trying to carry this thing. And uh, somebody slipped, the box slid all the way back down to the ground level. And the owner of the sound system, I think one guy broke his leg. And the owner of the sound system says, what to me box, what to me box. <laughs> so, <laughs> they love, uh, but that was, that was how it was, you know, and um, they were huge and the amplifiers. Um, in fact, my, my uncle who lived on Milkwood Road, he had a sound system called V Rocket back in the 1960s. And he said um, when he wanted um, his first amplifier built, he went to a hi-fi component shop somewhere in Brixton in the, um, in the mid-60s. And he said, this is the power he wanted, you know. And, uh, and he said, the guy, the counter uh, assistant behind the counter, he almost fainted when he explained the power he wanted this amplifier to be, you know, because they were very old fashion style with the valves on and the big transformers. And my uncle kind of drew him a diagram of what he wanted. And the guy looked at him, you're crazy, you're crazy. This will blow up an airfield or whatever. But he said, that's what I want, that's what I want. Yeah, these sound systems were, were huge. And the local sound systems were King Tubby, Safana B, so Coxon. And they had these huge cabinets, huge speakers, huge amplifiers. Sometimes the amplifiers are stacked up to this high. And uh, you could see them glaring and, you know, the, you see the light kind of effervescing. And, and uh, uh, me being a reggae fan, I used to kind of peer into the, uh, the cabinets, see how they were built, what uh, components made up these um, incredible uh, pieces of wiring and uh, engineering and so on, because I wanted to learn. I wanted to um, build my own sound system. So again, they were like um, the people who I looked up to, because I just love reggae music. I, I really did. It, it touched me, I guess. Um, I think Bob Marley called it a sufferer's music, you know, and uh, I felt the same. I felt they were singing about me, you know, my suffering, you know, that I had in Shirley Oaks and so on. So that's why I could really relate to it. And um, they had certain terms, the sound system guys, they had for, um, like, for instance, um, an exclusive piece of um, acetate that sometimes they were used in their competitions was called a dub plate. Um, the more smoochier songs were called Lover's Rock. The, um, the more militant songs, if you like, they were sometimes called rockers music or uh, spiritual music, or, you know, and, and certain sound systems would play in a certain way. Like, for instance, um, Sir Lloyd, who were very, very popular with my generation, especially in blues dances, they were called Lover's Rock Sound because um, that's what they played most of the time. And so you had different sound systems for different purposes. And so if you became a follower of a sound system, you knew what that sound system would play. And so there were genres in that genre, if you like. Now, the first time I heard of the term Brixton suitcase, I was in Brockwell Park and some dread, some dread. He had this massive um, ghetto blaster, I think is what, um, what most people know it as. And he, he, he called it as his bricks and suitcase, and that this made everybody laugh, or made me laugh. It was the first time I heard it. I think I was about 15, 16, and, and people were dancing in the park, you know, to this um, uh, bricks and suitcase, and the bass he got from that was phenomenal, you know, just turned up the bass. He, he, like, he thought he was at the control tower at King Tubby's studio in Jamaica, you know, he loved it. And of course, we, um, we, we tried to lug these things around every, everywhere we went. Uh, especially sometimes in the back of a sound system van. If you're traveling somewhere far, somebody would always bring their bricks and suitcase or their ghetto blaster, put in the tape, and then, you know, up the motorway, say, if your sound system's playing up in Nottingham or Manchester, you heard that all the way up there. So it was, it was great entertainment. 
of course, there used to be cusses and moans when the, uh, the reel from the cassette tape snapped in half. You know, that's all we had in those days. No CDs or um, digital music back then. So if the, if the cassette snapped, that was it. No entertainment on the journey back. You know, agony, agony. So um, we used to rely on that a lot. And there's always, always uh, guys in Brixton and girls too who sold cassette tapes from live dances in Jamaica. And this is how we heard the Jamaican DJs, DJs like Brigadier Jerry, people like that who we really looked up to, you know, uh, Josie Wells and uh, the Lone Ranger. They, they had really incredible names. Um, I think um, every, uh, even Clint, there was even a Jamaican Clint Eastwood. And so we would get these tapes and listen to them very attentively, especially if they were recent, you know. Uh, and these guys would sell these tapes for about two pound or three pound a go. And uh, you immediately, you know, got hold of these tapes, especially if you was an um, aspiring DJ and you played it in your bedroom. So, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pirate that lyric. But sometimes you go to the dance, you repeat the lyric that you heard from a Jamaican um, artist, and then the people that heard that tape already, they call you pirate, pirate. So you, I oh, know, I oh, know, I oh, know. You have to change your style, you know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, bricks and suitcase culture was hilarious, and everybody wanted one. My one was only about that big. <laughs> Some that big, you know. I'm sure they kind of uh, aimed it at our generation, you know, our our genre of people who love that kind of music. I'm sure they aimed it at us. Because I never used to see any goths or uh, rockers with that kind of equipment, did you? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I think the biggest change in the music scene in Brixton was, um, for my generation, it was a communal thing. Like, if you heard a release from uh, Dennis Brown that nobody's heard before, you hear it together. And everyone went, wow! You know, and you could all relate to that experience at exactly the same time. What's happening with the digital um, innovations and so on? That, um, that's not happening anymore. You know, people now listen to um, a new release on their own. And so we're not getting the reaction from their friends or people who they move with or particularly like the same music. I think that's the biggest, biggest change. So this is why the sound systems faded. The sound systems faded. And then you come to the era of the radio DJ. And they've, in a certain way, they've taken over now. But even even they now are kind of being sidelined now because you can, you could create your own DJ on a laptop now. You know, anybody could be a, a sound system, like, you know, the old sound system guy from the past by just downloading whatever they need to download and, um, and just go to a party or whatever and just play whatever the sound system uh, guys had. And so I feel a bit sad about that because music is now being... Um, it's, it's now a singular thing where um, it's not, you, you don't get a call and response as you did in my day. You don't get that same kind of excitement and energy of everybody listening to one track for the first time in their lives at a particular time. So it's really moved along from my day to where we have today. And I don't know, for me, that kind of saddens me, kind of saddens me because that experience was such an incredible one when you hear a new track from Gregory Isaacs or Burning Spear and you're in a dance with hundreds of other people and you're hearing it for the first time as well as you are. It's incredible energy. And um, i never forget um, that experience where the, um, the crowd delights in the song and everyone in unison says, put it up, put it up, put it up, put it to the... You know, and they play it again, the crowd erupts. I mean, you just don't get that now. Do you? Not, not, from what I see, not from what I see, anyway. And so now you have um, artists now growing up, uh, maybe the next generation coming up, and so they're practicing their rhymes and their lyrics in their bedrooms, you know, and uh, put, putting it on a, a key or, you know, and taking it around and not really knowing how the crowd might react to it. Where in my day, if you try the lyric, you just go to the dance and you try it out there and you get an immediate response. And so again, um, I think aspiring artists now don't have the opportunity to see where the lyrics are, are really taking them, whether it's really popular or not. But it's, it's more by luck that, oh, this works, rather than trying a lyric in a dance in my day, and you know 
that it works because of the response of the crowd. And so maybe I'm getting old school, but I hanker back to those days where um, it was tried and error, tried and error in front of a live crowd. You know, I think that's the biggest change in the music scene that I've seen. And maybe it could be the reason why some of the artists are not pushing on as they did. I mean, not as many as I like pushed on from my generation, but um, now we are hardly seen anybody push on from, um, from sound system culture, which is, I think, a shame. Today, strangely enough, I'm sometimes asked to uh, give advice to young police cadets about um, how to conduct stop and search and I always tell them that you have to imagine that whoever you're stopping uh, could be your niece your nephew or whatever because when you stop somebody and it's a bad experience when they go home it's not just a bad experience for them but if they tell their dad their mum their sister and so on it's a bad experience for that entire family and his friends and so that's what I tell the police now and so uh, um, back when I was you know, a t teenager, when I was getting stopped. Obviously, this is going to be a major to a topic, especially if the police are really um, you know, targeting young blacks. And so every dance you almost went to, this is always a topic of debate on the microphone, and people would um, uh, express their own experiences on the microphone. I mean, where else would they? And to me, this is not political in any way. It's just people uh, reliving their own experiences, you know, being stopped by the police or whoever. And so I can't see why people would say, no, people shouldn't do that. I mean, it's their lives. And if um, you're not happy with something, then what do you do? Do you internalise it? Or if you have the ability, why wouldn't you express that? And so that's what my generation did. And, um, and so this is, I guess, they were a number one nemesis, really, the police back... Um, you know, especially when I returned to Brixton from 14 onwards. And it was always a topic of uh, conversation, wherever I went, whatever friends I had, about the brutality, about the carelessness of uh, keeping you in custody and their um, dismissal of you, like you're, like you're somehow below them or don't deserve the rights of, you know, what they have. And it was always, always constant, I remember, and somebody, I think every DJ I heard back in those days had a lyric about the police being treated badly, you know, the homes being torn apart, uh, front doors being ripped off, floorboards being ripped up, you know, for no reason. And I, I particularly remember a lyric about floorboards being ripped up, you know, and uh, the joists being pulled, you know, you could see the joists after the plasterboard had been taken off and whatever in the pursuit of drugs or whatever it was, I don't know, but um, you, you, you could hear a lyric like that that related to that every week, every week. I mean, when I first came, my first week, I remember hearing friends of mine talking about um, police persecution and I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. I was 14, fresh from Surrey. I thought, no, the policemen, that's who you go to when you're lost. You know, that was my perception, that was my thinking. But no, that will change in that first week that I came to Brixton at 14 years of age when I knew it wasn't the case. And I was told immediately that they were my enemy. They were my enemy. You have to watch out for them, you know. And um, I noticed that um, the resistance grew from my time in Brixton up until the, uh, the 1981 riots. It grew. People um, didn't want to be arrested, so they started to throw up resistance. I think, um, I can't remember the Beres Hammond song, Putting Up a Resistance. That was, that was definitely the tone. And many of my friends, they just refused to be arrested. So the police would uh, try and outnumber you, you know. So it wouldn't take two of them. They'd have to employ four, six, eight. And so the numbers ratcheted up on, on both sides. So that's why you, you got to that big confrontation in April 1981. Because um, there were some guys I knew no way you could arrest them easily, you know, because they knew what might happen to them in a police cell. And we swapped these stories around. You know, when friends of yours have been beaten up and whatever in police cells, are you going to go quietly? No way. No way. And so um, I, was in a, I was in a pub just off Brixton Hill, not far from Elm Park, on a Friday night in April. 
mosque when um, a black guy come running in and he, he was shouting off that um, the police had killed somebody on the front line, uh, stabbed him or whatever. And because of, the, uh, because of our perception of the police and how we view them and how we saw them as the enemy and how they saw us as the enemy, we all believed it. Everyone believed it. And that night, I don't remember going to bed. I just remember going from flat to flat, going around friend's house and here and there and everywhere, and everybody's talking about this cannot go on. And so on a Saturday, um, we just went down to Brixton and see what was going to blow up, basically, because I think everybody knew something was going to go down. And there was such a presence that, that morning. You know, the record shops were jammed. I remember that. I was in Safanabi's record shop that morning, and I'd never seen it so packed. And usually in a record shop, you've got the sound system guys right near the counter with their piles of seven inches stacked up this high. And it was only the sound system guys who were paying any attention to the music. The rest of us were looking outside the windows, looking at the police, seeing what's going to kick off. Because there was a, a tension in the air from early morning, from nine o'clock onwards, there was a tension in the air. And then when crowds surged and moved, you kind of followed and see what happened until um, some guy was being um, arrested outside the uh, Atlantic car hire on, um, on Atlantic Road, I think it was. And everyone followed and within seconds, it just blew up. It just blew up. In fact, one of the funniest things I saw on a Saturday night was um, a cousin of mine. I, I didn't even know he was my cousin, but I found out later. We were related. He was an electrician. And he, he cut off the uh, electric supply from Maui Road. <laughs> so, and the police were lured into that road, and all of a sudden they were plunged into darkness. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't laugh, but <laughs> it was, um, I mean, even in those days, uh, we were employing guerrilla tactics, you know, because the police didn't know where they was, and they were getting them. Um, they were getting all kinds of objects thrown at them. So, uh, but yeah, that was one of the uh, moments that I remember. It's interesting because if you um, if you go back into the history of um, the West Indians or Jamaicans uh, coming to the UK, coming to South London, one of the first streets where they went to was Summer Layton. Was Summer Layton. After a few years, they started to spread out along Colarbo Lane. Uh, to, so where my mum was in Hernhill Road, where we are here, and they spread out further to um, Northland Street where my father, father lived, and further along to um, all around Ruskin Park, all around the, uh, the roads located near the hospital. And so these are the first places where um, our parents lived until they spread out all over the borough. But those were the first, first places. But, um, but going back to um, 81, um, one, of the, one of my uh, memories that I still think to this day was um, during a Saturday afternoon, I saw this little kid with a melted policeman's helmet trying it on. He, was, he must have been only about five or six. And uh, one of the, or the, or the other images was um, this quite an old woman. She must have been about 70 odd, and she's pushing a the, pushing the pram. And um, she had. Um, all these uh, boots uh, products in there, that toothpaste and soap and, <laughs> and so on. It's, it, was, it was incredible. You know, that's one of the lasting images I have of this old lady pushing up this, with this big pram. You know, it's old style prams. And she just thrown in all these uh, stuff from boots. I think boots had a, a store on the high street, I think it was. I think there was Woolworths there too. So that, that was quite incredible. Um, I remember um, going to a dance going to a dance um, that night and everybody had free drink. I mean, I guess one of my regrets, if I did have any regrets, was all the corner shops were gutted on Brixham Hill. Every single one was gutted. I mean, um, sometimes in Brixham, you, you always had hustlers selling Mars bars, cigarettes, whatever, but everyone had everything that day, that night. And uh, when I got home, I opened the fridge and there was about a thousand Mars bars in there <laughs> and uh, drink galore and uh, I went to this party in Hater Road and uh, that's when I first heard the lyrics about um, 
Raya Tina Brixstan and so on. And then um, I worked on my own. I worked on my Uprising lyric. It took me about, I mean, me, I was, I was very slow. I wasn't as sharp as those um, top DJs of that day. Like, um, if they did a lyric, they'd do it in a day. But me, I had to spend three, four weeks of mine, you know. And uh, even then it wasn't uh, totally finished. Um, and so I started with, um, it, was, it was on the back of a Dennis Brown album that I, I first started to work on Uprising. And uh, I think I got, I think that night I got the first four lines or something like that. And um, I worked on it for well over a month until, you know, I could really kind of explode it in the, in the dance hall. And um, yeah, the first four lines were, um, Operizing, it's a operizing, uh, operizing, it's a operizing. We sick and tired of the ghetto O's here and the jam sauce lot on police beating. We have no work and we have no shilling. And that's, that's what I had on that first night. But then, you know, uh, it progressed. Um, yeah, uprising, it's a uprising, uh, uprising, it's a uprising. Uh, Uprising, this a uprising. We sick and tired of the gutter hoes here and the jam sauce lot and police beating. We have no work and we have no shilling. We can't take no more of this suffering. You better send for the army and the home guard. We're gonna mash up and burn down this garden and yard. Come listen, people, to the Brixton board. Police officer, you better put up your guard. Go on. Uprising, this a uprising. Uprising, this a uprising. Uprising, this a uprising. We get up in the morning at 10.30, forward down the hill to the Brixton city. And, and, you know, it took me about five, six weeks until I could explode that. And, uh, and I'll get, you know, for the first time in my life, I've got, I've got a salute. I've got a salute. So that was great. So again, that was the first time I was kind of received as actually one of the good DJs of Brixton town. So... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's amazing. That must have been um, a really emotional experience for you to get that kind of feedback as well. Yeah, again, you could get it instantly. As soon as you finish a lyric, you could just hit the dance and beg the sound system guy, can, can you have the mic? Because there always used to be a crowd of guys around the mic, especially if it was a big sound. Like even Saloid sound is always about seven, eight guys around there or Nasty Rocker. Yes, we had, a, we had a sound system called Nasty Rocker. I think it was run by George, who, um, the Jamaican uh, Chinese guy who used to work in a uh, record shop called the, the General Penitentiary. And the General Penitentiary was named after a prison in Kingston, Jamaica. So, <laughs> and uh, there's always all these guys around a microphone. So, so, so as soon as you, you know, went for a breath, it was snatched away from you. So you had to get in there quick and grab the microphone and, and do your thing. So um, again, it was instant uh, response that you could get. From, from the audience to know if it was any good or not. So, uh, and that was great for any upcoming artist. And I just wish that, um, you know, uh, when the poetry jam thing exploded in bricks, and it was nice to see because it had remnants of that sound system culture where um, artists could actually go into a, somewhere a bit quieter. And it was kind of a bit different where, um, most of the audience was sitting down and sipping herbal teas and, uh, <laughs> and drinking uh, unnameable coffees and so on, you know. <laughs> and then you just get up and sometimes there was no musical backdrop. And I, I found that nerve-wracking. I really found that nerve-wracking. You know, I, you know, I, I, got, I used to get so nervous, you know. And um, I'd, I'd have a lyric book by that time. It's about this thick. And uh, I tried a warm-up thing that I would do in the um, sound, system, sound system dances. And, uh, but gradually I got used to it, you know, performing in that kind of environment. And um, I did okay in it. Again, I wasn't the best. Nowhere near the best. There's so many people who was better than me and so on. But again, it was good for me to express what I had here, what I had in here. Good for me to express. So again, that environment, uh, going to a poetry jam in Brixton. And this is what, mid-80s, late-80s, early-90s. It again lifted up my confidence. Hey, I'm an artist. My God, Alex Sweeto, he's an artist. I can, I can do this. And hearing the applause of the audience and so on. And that, again, encouraged me when people used to say, you know, why don't you write? Why don't you write something a bit more expansive? 
And so um, Bricks and Rock came about that way. My first novel, which was published in 99, so you can see it took me a number of years. But that experience, the South System experience, experience the, the Poetry Jam experience, hearing a live audience, give back their response, you know, clapping me, that slowly readied me for when I decided, you know what, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write a novel based on my experiences, based on my friends' experience and so on, about um, a mixed-race guy who's um, uh, taken away from the children's home, now he's living in Brixton. Uh, you know, let's see how it goes. And it was a struggle, you know, but finally, in 99, it got published, and here I am ch chatting to you today, what, eight books now. Eight books, and I even got to see the Queen. So, um, but it all started from that musical experience here, getting that confidence here. It's very important for people to know that. It all started from that, and um, I guess the likes of me and uh, uh, Michael Gross, um, we try to inspire um, young people who have that talent. Yeah, we, um, we spend a great deal of time trying to inspire young aspiring artists to um, produce what they have, you know, to get out the potential they have inside them and get it out there because um, their stories are important. You know, the people who grow up around these streets, their lives are important too. Why should it just be one middle-class narrative that we see? You know, why not all the other narratives that we have that not just live in Brixton but live all over? You know, working-class lives, narratives. That they're just as important as anybody else's. You know, it's, um, when you look to the cinema now, you're seeing the, um, the main protagonists come from middle-class backgrounds and so on. And that disappoints me because the, the UK is so rich with culture. We've always, this country's always been known for that. But I fear some voices are being suppressed while others, an elite, are kind of coming to the fore. I'd like to see that, I'd like to see more of a balance there. And uh, just telling our stories, just interviewing people who have um, been living around these, this location is, is important, I believe, and uh, gives some people some sense of importance, you know, because whoever has lived their lives along Kalaba Lane or the surrounding streets or even Hernil Road, when my dear mother was pregnant with me and came to the library to read and seek warmth in the winter, I think 1963 was one of the worst winters this country ever suffered. So that's one of the reasons why she came to this library. You know, her story is important. Uh, her neighbour's stories uh, are important also. And the people she grew up with, their lives are important too. So it's vital that we document this and we preserve it. We archive it. When I come back, when I come back to... Uh, to Brixton now, I live in Clapham, but when I come back now and I see old friends and I see uh, children of old friends and I hear their stories, I hear their narratives and find out what's uh, happened to them, sometimes I get so disappointed. I mean, there's one young lady who I know who's a daughter of a friend of mine. She, um, she was with child, she got pregnant, uh, she went to the council, she, uh, she was on a housing list and uh, they finally came up with something for her she, she only discovered that um, she has to, uh, she has no option if she wanted to place, she has to go to Folkestone. Now, this young lady, she grew up in this area. She went to nursery school here. She went to primary school here, secondary school. She went on to further education. And so what kind of society are we living in when um, we're abandoning our young people like that, say, go live 50, 60, 70 miles away? don't they have the right to live in their own community, where they have that family structure, where they have a support network, friends and so on. Why, why are we such in a rush to isolate people like that, young people like that? I think it's, you know, it's wrong. I really think it's wrong that people are removed from their, surgically removed from their communities like that. It's wrong and we have to do something about that, I believe. And, um, you know, councils, not just uh, Lambeth, but up and down the country should really think about... Um, the cohesion of uh, communities and young people, or not just young people, but older people too, and not just be so ready to accept the, um, the big dollars from uh, 
some development agency or company or whatever who just wants to buy up land and just um, build up units and sell those units for many hundreds of thousands of pounds to somebody with top dollar. It, um, there's got to be affordable housing too. There's no reason why they cannot exist side by side. You know, uh, affordable communities and people with money, uh, you know, who um, want to, want to uh, come to Brixton and live in Brixton. That's, that's fine by me. But um, beside that, you can't just uh, swipe away or just um, send away those communities that have been living here for generations. And that's what's happening. There's got to be a balance. And so I'm, I'm one who uh, wants uh, to bring in rent capping. So um, communities who do not necessarily own, earn um, 40, 45, 50 grand a year can survive here and exist here and thrive here and live comfortably here. Why shouldn't they have the right to do that? Especially if they um, grew up here, you know? Why shouldn't they have that right? I mean, now um, I, I fear that um, London is going to become like Paris, where um, the elite and those who are well old and well, well money, they live in the, in the centre parts of Paris. And all the others who service the city, who maybe are nurses or you know, fill all the working class jobs, they live outside the city. And to me, that's wrong. And I hope London doesn't become like that because London is great because everybody lives side by side. I mean, you could have a, um, a bus driver living next door to a, a doctor. And what's wrong with that? Why should it only be doctors who live in one place? You know, why, why can't I live jowl by jowl, side by side, with road sweepers, doctors, and bus drivers, and engineers, and, and so on? You know, London should be like that. Well, for me, Brixton without those elements that built it, um, that provided a foundation for it, for me, it, it, you, can, you might as well call it something else. You know, it's not the Brixton that I knew. Really, so if somebody comes up with a different name, I heard some people want to call it East Clapham or whatever. They might have to call it that because it's, it's lost its essential um, feeling, its, its, its vibe. If you keep removing the building blocks that created it. I mean, people come to Brixton because, oh, Brixton is liberal, it's, it's going to have an art scene, it's going to be buzzing and so on. But if you remove all the elements that made it into that, then it's not going to be there anymore. So you have to keep elements of that. And the way to keep elements of that is by trying to keep people who live here, who grew up here, in that same community. So that um, the people who come in from the outside can learn from those um, community elders or whatever, or, or even the young people of the community. And they learn what Brixton's all about. They get to know their narratives, their own life stories and, and so on, and appreciate it and respect it. And maybe build on that with their own narratives. And they're all intertwined. That's a beautiful thing. But you can't just have people just coming in, not knowing what's gone on before. And all the people who've been here before, they just been moved out. And then that's, that's a completely different thing, for me anyway. And for me, that's sad if you lose that, lose that vitality of a certain area. And if um, we don't act um, before long, we would go to um, communities and towns up and down the UK, and there'd be a sameness to them. The sameness, you know, with the same shops, the same name brands, and so on. It, every high street will look the same. Every market will look the same. They will sell the same things. You hear the same music. You you see the same art, and so on. You know, is that how we want to be as a nation? I don't think so. I think people want to see that uniqueness of certain areas. You know, I like going to um, places like York where they've got their um, different unique culture, if you like, or Liverpool or Manchester or Edinburgh. I like that. You know, people go to Edinburgh because they want to see Edinburgh. They want to feel Edinburgh. I'm going there in two weeks' time. It'd be great for me. It's another culture. And um, I'm sure if um, someone in Edinburgh wants to come down to Brixton, they want to see the real Brixton. They don't want to see a, a copied version of Edinburgh or Leeds or whatever. They want to see Brixton. So that's why we should try to fight to keep it as it is or as it was.